Welcome everyone. Um, we're excited to continue Campus Compact's national webinar series with our first offering of the new year. Happy New Year to everybody. Um, I'm Maggie Grove. I'm the interim president of the Compact and I'm excited to introduce Bobby Hackett, the Bonner Foundation, and Scott Myers Lipton at San Jose State, who are going to be presenting on teaching social action today for this session. Um, typically, we start off our webinars with just some quick updates from Campus Compact. I'm going to put a link in the chat in a minute for those of you that might have missed our spring 2022 programming announcement. We've got lots of great things happening this spring. Um, if you haven't registered yet for Compact 22, our national conference is going to be March 29th through the 31st. It's all online. Fantastic lineup, and you can check out all, all the details on our website. We have just opened up a call for um, the new cohort our, of our Engaged Scholars Initiative. So uh, please pass the word on and think about uh, jumping into that for early career folks. Um, along with our communities of practice and affinity groups, tons of great things happening this spring. And again, I'm going to drop a link in the chat and uh, want to invite Bobby and Scott to take it away and introduce yourselves a little bit more deeply and uh, provide us with some framing for the session. But welcome and thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm Bobby Hackett. Um, and uh, uh, I'm just going to get a little bit of background on myself and how Scott, how Scott and I met. Um, have Scott introduce himself. I'm going to share a link to a mural board, which we'll use instead of slides. Um, and you'll get that here in a second. But I, um, I've been doing this work for a long time. And uh, we've always talked about the arc from charity to justice. Um, we've always been interested in and when we ran cool, which I helped start in the mid 80s. Um, there was a sense of get students involved in hands on direct service and gradually develop them and their awareness, understanding, and they would eventually want to work on policy questions and then bring about systemic change through various kinds of social action. Um, and uh, when I came to the foundation, we'd have a four year, many of you know Bonner is a four year service based scholarship program. And gradually we were putting in lots of the pieces of that in that developmental arc. But frankly, we, we, we did, and nobody on staff had experience uh, or sort of a model for how to teach students to change policy. We had developed around stuff around community-based research and a policy research component to that, which is an is in the form of, it, of issue briefs. Um, but we really didn't have that other piece. Um, and frankly, I was kind of embarrassed by it. Um, but you know, you kind of do what you know how to do. And I, I went to a, a, a gathering uh, in honor of a, 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 a mutual friend of Scott and myself, uh, a guy named John Sarvey, who'd been involved with Cool and also very involved with City Year. And um, we got talking. Um, and it turns out Scott teaches social action, as many social uh, the, the sociology faculty members do. Um, but what, was, what I learned very quickly was in his model, students launch campaigns during the semester. And I said, well, that we have to expand. So we've been partnering for four, almost five years now. Uh, he's the expert. I'm sort of tech support and a sounding board. Um, but the, the goals for us in this session are to try to, to show you why we think it's so important to teach this way and to try to encourage more of you to do so, either you yourselves or you to you know, our recruit faculty. I'm going to, uh, I see the question there, but I'm going to turn it to Scott to introduce himself yep. and then we'll start going through. Yeah. So thanks, Bobby. I'm, I'm Scott Myers Lipton. I'm a professor at San Jose State. I've been there, I think, 22 years now. Um, so a long time. I've been doing this work, uh, specifically teaching this class now coming on my 16th year. So uh, the, quite, a, quite a few times over 30 kind of iterations of it. Um, I would just say briefly, the idea came out of um, actually a, a much larger project I was working on back in, in, as my students would say, back in the day, back in those 1980s when, when Bobby was starting Cool, um, along with Wayne, I was working on a leadership program, a two-year leadership program based in service learning that would train kind of the next generation of civically engaged people. It was a two-year program. And then 
I developed three of those programs and then twins came and uh, that changed my life to have twins. And I, I started thinking, how could I do what I do, but do it in a way in one class. So kind of all the knowledge I had gained around this, this three, it's two year leadership model came into teaching this class that I called social action. So we're gonna take you through this process of, of why we think it's important to be doing this. So I'm gonna post, uh, I'm not sure if I can do this in the chat. Uh, the um, Campus Compact folks might share, but I, th th this is a, um, a massive whiteboard called a mural board and murals the software. Some of you may have seen this. Um, and if you can have a link, you can get in there and navigate around yourself. We'll post the link afterwards. You can come back in and visit it. Um, but our, our, as I said here, our intent here is to focus a lot on the why to do this, a little bit on the what, the way this course is taught, the what sort of part of it. Um, I, what I'm not going to do is we're going to spend a little bit of time on how it's taught in terms of the actual content, but we'll let you guys ask some questions on those. So I'm going to first kind of try to get a sense of who's in the room. So I'm going to put a couple poll questions up. Uh, so the first one is demographic. Um, who, who's here? Uh, are you a faculty member? Are you a staff member on a campus? Community partner? Or are you other? Great. So the, uh, just about everybody's answered. Uh, so we got about, uh, 17 faculty, uh, 35 campus staff, a partner, one community partner, and a, and a couple other folks. So that's great. So I'm going to end the poll. I can share the results. There you go. I haven't done a lot of polls in Zoom, so this will be uh, new for me. Okay, so the second question, uh, the second poll um, is, stop sharing that. Uh, here we go. Teaching question. Do you teach classes or do you, or, or alternatively, do you lead workshops in a co-curricular setting? Right. Fantastic. I uh, just end the poll real quick. I'll share it. So it's 60, 40, which is great to see. Um, and as we talk about this, you'll see that we, there's a model for doing this as a co-curricular workshop series, which is why we asked that question. So the next question uh, up front is uh, about social action, which is, do you teach or lead workshop series or you know, have led a workshop series on social action? Have you covered this topic? Great, great. So it's very, very close to the same 60-40. Uh, in this case, 60% 60, uh, 60 roughly, um, or uh, haven't taught that, and 40% have. Now, one of the things we're going to do up, up front is we're going to talk about the definition that Scott's using in, in, for, for social action, because social action as a phrase can cover lots of things. It's like service learning can cover lots of things. Um, so we'll talk to touch that in a second. And the last one is, um, when you have taught, if you do teach, do you have students, uh, uh, do a campaign in the class as part of the workshop? Do they, do they, are they, do they lead one? Do they participate in somebody else's campaigns in the real world? That's great. So uh, I'll end the poll there. So of those who teach it, uh, about uh, a third uh, have students do, do the actual campaign work, which is great to see. And that's the key to the model that we're talking about here. Um, let me just share the results real quick so you can see those. Okay, so that's, 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 uh, that's it for our, our sort of polls. Uh, um, and I appreciate that uh, from everybody. Real, um, so 
Scott, I'm going to hand, hand to you to sort of talk about the definition, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, this model versus a more traditional model of teaching social action. So the definition I'm using when I'm talking about social action is this one right here. When everyday people, and, uh, and that's important. I teach at San Jose State University. It's a working class university. It's a place where um, primarily students of color. Um, and it's a, it's a place where most of my students, and we can talk more about this, but most of my students have never participated in trying to change anything, you know, in, in the community. And so everyday people is the idea that it, it's all of us, you know, in our democracy being invited into this work. So when everyday people, rather than elite, you know, rather than the, the, the folks that are, you know, decision makers are seen as decision makers, um, so it, it's that contrast. When everyday people band together, so we'll talk about this banding together, coming together to develop their power, to develop their power, that the, you know, the word power is, is a really important word that we'll talk about. We spend a whole couple of classes just on that one word, what does it mean, to change policy. And that last part is key, is like to change a rule, a regulation, a practice of an institution. So when the students leave, it's still ongoing, uh, whatever, whatever the change that has happened, they don't have to be there to continually do it. And it differentiates itself away from service, which is important, which I've done a lot of myself too, but it says that we're gonna change a policy within either the campus or the community. So that's the definition. When everyday people band together to develop their power to change policy. Great. Okay, so uh, um, I, the, I believe the Q&A option is there. So if you've got questions as we go along in this format, uh, please use that. Um, so we're just gonna talk a little bit about, we sort of put this together for the first time. So this is not a perfect, uh, uh, edited traditional versus experiential. But what I wanna begin by saying is, if you teach, if you're a professor in social uh, work or sociology, for sure, there are courses on community organizing, social change, social action, social movements. And so what we're, what we're gonna do here is contrast roughly a traditional model for teaching versus an experiential model. I do wanna say that we went, you know, did, just reminded ourselves that this, this fits very well, the traditional versus active learning model that we know about um, where it's more passive and so forth. Uh, we also sort of, we're looking at that, another example of, of that, um, you know, that whole idea of sort of tell me and I'll understand a certain amount, but let me do it and I'll really understand it. Uh, there's even interesting stuff out there on problem-based versus project-based and some of the work that that's going on in this model touches on both of these in a very interesting way. Really would be a sort of a good combination of the two. Um, but Scott, maybe just talk, talk through some of this. So I, I think, and, and I would say, and we'll talk more about it later about where it's being taught because it's, it's being taught in, in sociology, of course I teach it, but it's also in political science, in social work, in environmental studies, in anthropology, in African-American studies. So it, this model can be adopted kind of throughout you know, our various disciplines, even, even in, in a business uh, program. So it, you know, in a traditional, when people are talking about social action, right? Students read about theories of change and reflect on it. Here, students read about those theories, but actually apply it to their campaigns, right? So there's this, this inner, you know, this reflection action, you know, that's going on. This, this what I would call a Ferrarian model of, of education rather than maybe a banking system model. Students think about and analyze social problems. Every sociology, I'm in sociology, every sociology program has a course on social problems. Very few have one on social solutions. And really this is what that is, is giving the students a chance to define the problem and develop concrete quantifiable solutions that, are, that is demands. And we're gonna talk about that soon, which is this notion that the students are the ones that choose, not the professors, but the students are choosing the solutions they wanna pursue. Um, students read about campaigns, right, of course. You know, there's always, you know, you know, if you're taking a social change class, you'll hear about campaigns. But in this case, students choose and lead campaigns. Yeah, they read about campaigns, but they're also choosing and leading campaigns. 
if they're working with a community organization, many times they're creating a student wing of that campaign, which gives them, um, you know, they're allied with the, the larger group, but that gives them a little bit more independence from that. So we've learned that student wing model works well. You know, this old language of back, going back to service learning faculty is sage on the sage, and in this model, guide on the side, decentered and co-creators of knowledge. Students learn about social action, history, and theory, and of course, they do it in this one, they, and they experience it. And maybe the most powerful, I mean, there's so many powerful parts about the model, but where students are developing abstract understanding of concepts in you know, a traditional model, this, they're actually, students themselves are transformed through a direct experience with democracy and power. And I think that's really powerful, this transformational experience that so many of the students have because of the engagement of, of theory and praxis. Awesome. Maybe have some questions about that. We could, you know, if you could put them in, we're glad to respond. Yeah, so, Pope, so, so uh, you know, write up your questions. Uh, I can see people are on the mural board, which is nice. Um, and I'll just put that in the chat one more time to make sure people, no, actually, I won't do that right now. All right, so let me just, let me just show, talk for a second. I'll introduce this sort of flow of a, of a, of a semester. Um, and or a year, um, I'll just introduce it and then have Scott walk through it. But, but basically, the big difference here is that um, he, here are the are the sort of the, the basic topics that are covered. This lower one shows you the actual flow in the model. That this is a class that in a, in a class that meets twice a week. Um, here's the flow. So the color it's color coded against these themes and topics. Um, the big thing to notice is that they have to launch the campaign. They launch the campaign by week nine. So the, and then they do a multi, maybe a couple more, one or two more actions over the course of the rest of the semester. Scott can talk about that. But it's the idea of, this is a, 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 a comes from the on your mark, go get set is something we used to cool, which was don't worry too much about getting everything organized before you launch. Here, the go is you got to figure out your campaign early. Uh, just so you know, at the bottom here, if you had a workshop series and you had students for a whole school year, you actually could do one session a week for the first semester and they could launch and run the campaign the whole second semester. That just gives you the sort of the two ends of the spectrum. But Scott, maybe you can just sort of walk through some of these and, and um, some other yeah. thoughts about this structure. Well, I think the, the key part, as, as Bobby said, is that it's front loaded, right? It's front loaded to choose the campaigns early. And, and, and this just came out of, you know, when I developed the idea for a social action class back in 2006, this idea like, you know, when, when, and all the books that are available, and we'll talk about resources, I'd say most of the books have choosing campaigns and it's usually a, a several month process within a community organization, they choose a campaign. Um, and, and it's usually done like in chapter six or seven of most books on change. And that just doesn't work for a classroom environment. It has to be done upfront and early. And so and if you look at issue development on that second, you know, it's, a, it's the go part. And really the go is, you know, the go is they, they're, they're choosing their campaigns in those first four classes. And issue development is a process I take them through, which is to identify a target, someone, the lowest ranking person that can meet their demand. They, I, I help them take slogans because as you know, our students would be like, let's end racism. And I'd say, well, that's a slogan. It's a good slogan, you know, but it's not a specific policy, whether it's on the campus or the community. So I help them in a process of taking ideas that are, I would say are slogans and move them to, you know, or chance and move them to um, specific demands that are quantifiable and that a target could say yes or no to. Um, so, and I'll give, I'll give a variety of examples of that, you know, shortly um, about like how, about the specificity of demands. Um, but the key part is it's front loaded. In the first four classes, the students, my class five, the students have all selected campaigns and they, and, and they can choose whatever campaign they want to. Some, I, I bring in students that, uh, I bring in folks to talk to them about campaigns that are running on the community. Students have ideas about campaigns. There are previous student campaigns that are running that make a pitch. 
And, but the key part is that you, the students choose their three to five campaigns that they're gonna work on. They'll only work on one, of course, but I have 30 students. So there's usually four or five going on in that first four or five classes. Um, the other key part of this is that if you notice that class nine through 15, that part after the teaching around, you know, the, of the get set part, like all the things they need to do to get set to launch the campaign, that happens in the first eight weeks of class. And then week nine through 15 can still be focused on, if you're teaching a class on climate change, for example, could be very focused on the material around climate change or any other topic matter. If you're teaching, you know, African-American studies course, you could focus the, you know, the content in that period after they have um, they got set and they and they're and they're going and we'll talk you know maybe some more specifics if you have questions I'm sure you will um, and then the third part I want to focus on is if you look at that little thing where it says campaign notebook can you focus in on that on Bobby that is a really important so the students do a campaign notebook at the end of the class and they hand that in it's their final you know it's their final exam and that campaign notebook is then given to the next group of students on the, the next semester. Because I teach the class every semester at San Jose State, there'll be five social action classes going on. So we'll actually share those campaign notebooks from last semester with uh, these five classes and the students can continue campaigns or not. It's really up to them. So sometimes a campaign notebook just sits on a on, a, on, a, on the desk for three or four months, doesn't get reactivated. It depends on the student's interest if the campaign, but all the, the history of the campaign, their research on the campaign, the theory around the campaign is all in there. Their framework and their strategies and tactics are, are all in there. And the other thing I wanted to support, uh, put your attention to is a typical class. What is a typical class that's decentered? that's, you know, where it's, um, where it's uh, where the, you're a, a guide on the side rather than that sage on the stage. I have to do, I, I do quizzes, you know, probably I give eight quizzes. It's a lot out of 30 classes because my students all work. And this is, I have to really encourage them to read. And one way I do it is by giving them quizzes on the reading. Very simple if they've done the reading, uh, but this makes sure that students read. So I, you know, typical class is five to seven minutes of, of a quiz on a reading. They'll do um, by the, first third of the class, they'll start every class with an organizational wrap that the st a student will do. Uh, different students from the various campaigns will stand up and give their one minute, one to two minute organizational wrap, which they are expected to be giving in classrooms and in tabling and it to other student groups. So it gives them practice. And it's very much, uh, you know, we hear the students do their wrap and then they have an outline for that wrap of how to do it. And there's um, both kind of, you know, this is what the student did really well, and here are some things to make it better. Students really like that. It's very interactive, very dynamic. Then there's 30 minutes of a mini lecture on the reading. I'll, I sometimes zoom in um, an alumni who's gone through the experience that they might have even read about in a campaign. So they hear that from that. There might be a video on social action and, and these resources we'll share with you. We have a lot of videos of the students doing social action. So we have those to show and to inspire the students. And then 20 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes on teamwork on the campaign. And for the team is, you know, to do the work of the campaign. You know, the, it's, uh, you know, and it's usually trying to move the campaign forward. And there's, you know, thousands of things when you're in a campaign to work on. So I, I then go in individually and talk to those teams as they're working. So that's a, a typical class. So, so Scott, think, uh, so we have one question here. Uh, uh, do, uh, do they create their own campaign or do they get involved in an existing campaign through other community organizations within their community? I worry about duplication of efforts and especially of displacing or overtaking community work. And no, they no, should no. add that connect students to already existing organizations like BLM or Faith in Indiana. Well, uh, I, I it's the kind of thing she's talking about. I send out an email to a variety of the community organizations. You know, I, the ones that, I, that are in our community, I'll send an email and say, please, if you have a campaign that's trying to change a policy, whether at the local, state, national level, and you're, you're interested to come and talk to my students to see if they're interested in joining a campaign, they come in. And, and what happens with that, I'd say about a third of the campaigns are community focused, either at the city, 
county, state, or national level. About a third of my students are working in those campaigns. And a lot of times the community organizations, they actually then come in once a week to the class when we're doing that team building, the, the campaign work, and they'll send one of their community organizers in to help facilitate the students to make sure they're connected to the larger campaign. Um, so absolutely, so it's not overtaking at all what the community is. You, it, and they really see it as an investment in the future and investment because they're trying, they're training the next generation of civically engaged people. And um, so, so yes to that. And then for the stuff that's going, if they, they're creating a campus, something on the campus, which I'd say maybe 60, you know, 60% of the, of the campus groups, you know, if, you know, let's say they're working, we had a student group working on homelessness student homelessness on our campus. I'm not sure about yours, but our campus has 11% of our student body experienced homelessness. So they are working on, on specific solutions. And so they work with, they're in collaboration with the leading homeless advocates that are coming and they're meeting with this, the students are meeting with them and getting ideas from them. And they're advocating with them uh, together with the faith community as well. They show up at their, and they speak at their events, the, the, the faith community, because they're, and they're allies of the students. So I, not very, definitely not taking over very much a collaborative environment. Scott, just on that last point, uh, with the, when the community partners come in uh, to recruit some students yep. uh, and, and maybe present, do you offer them an honorarium or stipend of any kind? Um, I don't offer for you know, a, a, a community member. They don't know, but they, the, a lot of times the, the, the organizers that come in are getting paid for their, for their work. So, but we don't offer an honorarium. I will say we have uh, reached out to foundations and they've actually, are, you know, the county first and now a foundation is supporting the students to continue the work. If they want to work on the campaign after they graduate, because the, the campaign ends, it doesn't end, but the campaign, you know, from my perspective, at the end of the semester, they don't need to, they're not required to do it. But if they want to do it, um, there's a foundation that's put up money to help the students continue the work and pay them to do that. So that as, is, in, a, as in a sense, a, an internship. Yeah. Um, and then uh, you, you mentioned this briefly, but, uh, and we're going to give some examples here in a second, but uh, there's a question here. Can you gear this class to policies on a certain subject, like the arts? Yeah. Well, I think if you're teaching in the, let's say you're teaching a class in the arts, it would kind of naturally move that way, right? Um, so I would say yes, you know, I, but I think the key thing is that you let the students choose the specific policy about what they're going to do. One, it's empowering because the students are never really given that opportunity to have that much like say in their educational process or many times not that much. So they feel very empowered that this is their idea. And the second is it allows for, and I'm in contact with the administration at my campus a lot. Um, I, I let the Dean, my Dean know about all the campaigns that are going on. So he has a heads up about them. And, um, and, and I think that, that, that's an important part of like kind of keeping open communication with administration around that. Yeah. So I'd say, yeah, you, you could do, you could do so. I think if you're doing class, let's say in, in, in the arts, you could for sure say, but I think the key thing is like, whatever the policy is, like they would choose that because then it gets away from like, I'm brainwashing the students or I have my agenda around this, that they should do X, Y, and Z about it. Right. Well, let's move to share uh, a couple highlights. Um, uh, from from some campuses that have been uh, both Scott's and then uh, two other schools where the faculty have participated in some of the trainings that Scott has led. And uh, we'll do a, a sort of more in-depth example of the first one here from San Jose State. Um, and then we'll we'll touch on the last two uh, or the other two. But uh, Scott, do you want to uh, do you want to start with this or do the video or do you want to just uh, set this one up? Yeah, I said it. So I just say about this, this is Student Homeless Alliance. Uh, they, it, what's interesting about the Student Homeless Alliance is that they started, I mean, there's a long history going back to 1990s uh, of the Student Homeless Alliance, but they've historically, before I was even on the campus, there was a student group called Student Homeless Alliance. But that group dealt with um, folks in the community that were homeless. And then 2017, the crisis hit our own student body. And um, the students 
uh, out of my class decided to take up this this organization and make some very specific demands and um, which they've won many things on the campus for the student for the student body of San Jose State. For example, they won 12 emergency beds for the, the campus. Um, they've won a center that's um, it's, uh, very centralized. It was not centralized before and it's confidential where students can say not publicly but privately about their situation and, and ask the university and the, the community organizations that work with the university that are right there for help. However, one of the interesting things about a campaign, even though the students won a big victory around these 12 emergency beds, it's been difficult. The, the university has created all these rules uh, around them to stop them from getting the beds. Like they have to maximize their student loans to get a bed. So the Student Homeless Alliance in late November held this rally to, to show and to put pressure on the president who is about to leave. They're trying to get her to um, meet a demand, which is to not maximize student loans. Even though the university says they're not, all the students who are, who've contacted the Student Homeless Alliance say that they, that's what they do. And we have it from the, from the nonprofit that actually runs it, that or helps run that program says it the same, says that's true. So they led this kit, they're, they're, they've actually won many victories. And, um, and I would say, you know, it's probably um, seven, eight students in, that are in part of the Student Homeless Alliance. So it's not this huge group. And they're out of the seven or eight students that are active, maybe four or in four or five of them are from the class. And that class every semester, they have a choice to continue that group. The Student Homeless Alliance comes in and talks. If they don't get three students to join, the, the, there's no students in social action that will be part of the Student Homeless Alliance. So it's very much student driven. So do you want to show the video from this? Yeah, let me show the video. And I saw Ann Schulte has a question. Yeah. And I think if you either put it in the Q&A section or in the chat, we'll be able to see it. Otherwise, I, I'm not able to um, have you uh, ask your question. Let me see if I can make this work. Okay. You booked a sunny verb. I forgot to get rid of this part. Sorry, gang. <laughs> Control by San Jose State University and one of its student groups remain at odds over how to best serve students affected by homelessness. KW South Bay reporter Jesse Gary is on the SJSU campus with more on the impasse and possible ways forward. Jesse. The Student Homeless Alliance and the university had an agreement on how best to serve the needs of this homeless student population. But a year later and the two sides are seeing the progress that has been made very differently. And that is creating friction at a time of institutional change. Right now is a very stressful time for this population. Having to do with finals on top of figuring out where they can rest for the night can be a huge burden for some. The grass next to the Olympic statues is partially covered with symbols the Student Homeless Alliance says represent an ongoing problem. Each paper house in place is for each San Jose State student who, at some point, experienced homelessness last year. We have a moral imperative to break this cycle of, of poverty. And here at San Jose State University, they can do that. Students and faculty too. At a noon rally, student homeless advocates decrying university efforts to live up to a 2020 agreement to help students in need. They say for the first half of the fall semester, of the 100 students who applied for emergency housing, only one bed was granted. Additionally, they claim the university wants students to take on debt before being considered for housing help. What this university does is the old school of you have to deserve a bed. The school should be doing the work to provide basic needs, but instead they're trying to get us to do it for them. Students are not required to take out loans in order to receive housing assistance. University uh, Vice President Catherine Voss Blackston points to successes such as consolidation of assistance services in a new SJSU CARES office and the housing of not one, but at least 60 students in emergency housing during the first half of the fall semester. She says state is committed to cutting red tape to make the process easier. We look at the range of student needs and sometimes a student may indicate to us that they have needs around housing and we find that it is uh, complex, that it's connected to many other types of issues. Students say any progress made over the past 12 months is minimal and that this institution can do better. It is not enough to make claims of future implementations when deadlines have passed and students remain unhoused. 
in their greatest times of need. President Mary Papazian is set to leave in the coming weeks. Students are hopeful that the progress and the dialogue they had with Papazian will carry over to the interim president. We're live on the SJSU campus here in San Jose. Jesse Gary, KTVU, Fox 2 News. We'll head back to you. Up and over. All right, Jesse, thank you so much for that line. So I think the key thing about that is that those students have never, all those students never did anything like that in their lives. So they've never held a press event. They never had to write a press release. They never had to work with the faith community. They never had to reach out to nonprofits. All of that, the alliance building, the press strategy was all learned in the class and um, is part of the model. So maybe and it's, a, and it's a big part of where the transformation comes in, right? Folks who don't think they have a voice, don't know how to organize themselves, you know, and then they do. And they also they're in these big press conferences. And we have, um, we'll show you at the, at the last part of this resources, which include other videos for other campaigns, earlier stages of this campaign. Um, what we, uh, I, I see there's a question here. Um, do students who are not enrolled in the class tend to join with the project or, or, or join with the campaign? Absolutely. In fact, you know, one of the things they do is like, so go, if you want to go back, can you pull back to show um, building power, like where, I, where it's on the next one over there? It's like Dave, you know, the, there you go, building power. So part of building power. So here we are. And if you look at that's the green one, we're in week four, you know, most classes are just beginning to get going here. We've already, they've already chosen their campaign. And they've already figured out what their demands are going to be. And now they're not going to their target yet, but they're starting to articulate to their, um, to the community, to the student, many times the student body through tabling, through, um, through giving classroom presentations, Every, any faculty will give a student a minute or two to give a presentation. So they start standing up and giving that organizational wrap. So they're, they learn they're right from the beginning, they're having to publicly engage. And uh, they realize how much they don't know about the project, by the way. And that's the whole idea that research is coming and they're going to have a whole chance to do a deep dive into research. So it's flipping the model of education where the, the students are being driven by the need to want to learn rather than me saying, hey, this is really important for you to learn. But they have to kind of have that knowledge if their campaign is going to be successful. And yes, so that recruitment is a huge part of building power. I always say to them, if you do a rally like that, if you have 10 people that come, is it better to have 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 people? And clearly the number is more people is better. So absolutely, they, they're encouraged to bring in other people. By the way, that encourages more people to take social action classes uh, you know, in the future too, if, if they're interested. So that's San Jose State's doing, you know, working on, 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 that was just one of five campaigns that were running last semester. This is a campaign at the College of New Jersey. Dr. Shikau is teaching this class in anthropology as an environmental studies or and the climate change um, class. And um, this class is on food waste and getting and it's very specific goals of getting composting bins I'm very much a quantifiable, you know, quantified. I want to have to say how many bins do we want is and how much is it going to cost? Those are, are part of the demands you're going to want to make. Um, and then eventually a biodigester. And again, you want to have what's the cost of that biodigester on, you know, as part of your demands. But very much um, here is, um, and they ran five campaigns, I think, out of this climate crisis class or climate. And, they, and the campaigns varied. So, so this is only one of five because it was a broader topic. But but all their campaigns by design are focused on the college. And they've, they've won some, they've won some uh, of those campaigns. They, they were able to persuade the school to form a position on sustainability. And they won a couple other ones. Um, and then at a Middlebury Institute of International Studies at, at Monterey, this is actually a graduate program in business and he does it on social entrepreneurship. And this was just one of the campaigns um, on ending period poverty in Monterey Bay County. And their, their demand is specifically around having shelters, having, making sure the county provides the shelters with menstrual and, um, and products um, so that folks are able to care, you know, take care of themselves around when, when um, during that time, right? So it's a, it's a great project and, um, and 
I think they, they had a lot of energy and they actually got a, a, an article in the, in the press for themselves on that. And Monterey Institute has won some campaigns as well. We, we held a, uh, we're, we're, we're calling it the first annual uh, a student, uh, uh, a college student social action summit. And we had student teams from these three campuses present their campaigns, their campaign pitch and had a little dialogue. Uh, there's some common issues across campuses, so that was interesting. And we will, we will continue to do that as we grow more faculty, more, more campuses are, are doing this, uh, this model. We wanna, we wanna connect those student teams. And Zoom, of course, makes that very, very plausible approach. Um, so those, so those, those are the three highlights from the last semester. There's this question uh, that was asked, which is, there, is there a minimum number of students needed to run a campaign yeah, yeah. In Scott's class, the answer is yes. It has to be at least three students on a team. But three students can change the world. So you start with three and you can make something happen. Um, please keep asking questions on the, on the uh, chat or in the Q&A part. I want to turn here for a second to our uh, resources. Um, but I'm going to start just by sort of uh, making this point that our goal is to mainstream the teaching of social action with an experiential model, right? This sort of do, learn by doing, so that every college campus has at least one course where students are learning by doing social action. And at the College of New Jersey, Miriam Shackow was the first faculty member. In a subsequent semester, she has recruited three other faculty to build this into their, their courses, at least one of their courses, with the goal there they have is every semester there's at least one class being taught. Um, you heard that the last product, the last thing in a class is to hand in the campaign book. That gets presented to the next class. So oftentimes campaigns are picked up from one semester to the next, but not always. Sometimes they, the next group doesn't pick it up, but a prior campaign from a two or three semesters ago can still get uh, that be presented and picked up. And as we said earlier, community partners are also coming in and recruiting students to be part of their campaigns or the, you know, the student wing of their campaigns. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about this because it's hard for Scott to brag about himself, but uh, he had been using lots of other great books and guides on, on community organizing and social action and decided that it made sense for him to develop his own and structured that, uh, in, in, frankly, in the model, in that flow we just showed you. So the, the book in blue here is uh, a student guide to social action, and it has reflection questions at the end of each uh, chapter, uh, uh, lots of examples, and it's the not the only text. And you'll see, you can we'll be able to show you his his course syllabus, but it's a core text. Um, so that's up. I, I wrote, published that a couple years ago. Um, over this past uh, year, Scott's been writing now the teaching guide, um, and we didn't call it a faculty guide because the feeling is that. Uh, staff can teach this, students can teach other students. Um, so part of our goal is to not to, 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 to mainstream this, we want to cast a very broad net and look at multiple approaches for this kind of work to be taught so that students not only learn these skills, but they run effective campaigns. Um, so this new one is coming out. Uh, at the bottom of this page, if you have access, you can see it says open. And that will take you to the website. Uh, these are also on Amazon, but I think we're taking you to the Rutledge. Well, we're taking you actually to a, a page on our website, the Foundation's website, which has, uh, as the book goes through, there's readings and resources. And so all those are available you know, in the footnotes uh, that are referenced. So we have those there for you. We also, by the way, this is where you can see other campaign flyers. It's kind of fun to see the variety of things that students have been working on. Um, uh, some photos of the early tabling that students do just sort of brings us to life a little bit more. And then, as I said earlier, there's multiple videos, even documentaries on this that you'll be able to uh, uh, track down. So uh, those links there allow you to see that. Now we have uh, also created, well, the, the, the Bonner Foundation has a, a, um, a wiki with a lot of resources. Um, uh, for the Bonner model and more broadly campus-wide, campus-wide centers, but includes a whole section on social action. Again, you click here and you get to that portion 
And this takes you right to the guides. And this will be a link to that student book, the faculty book. Our early efforts here, we begin to pull together the tips. Those then got expanded on and written up into the into the actual book. But this this follows the basic the structure of that uh, resource. There are lots of other things here um, uh, to to draw upon uh, more campus examples um, and other documents to download. So there's a lot of stuff there, including other webinars we've led. And this is constantly getting updated and, and, and refined as we go along. Um, so we have that resource for folks. Uh, it's a complement to the books um, and a place to keep it current. We do. We have a couple other things. One is we're 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 building a community of practice. Um, and here's uh, this is on a platform the foundation's using. Um, we 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 call our sort of page the the the. Uh, uh, it's the social action group. It's it, our whole platform is called the Bono Learning Community, um, and this is a group that we're going to be putting more energy into it this coming semester. So we won't be spending as much time doing a webinar series ourselves, but you can see some of the prior presentations, updates, announcements. Um, uh, who else is part of this? This is sort of the who's 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 joined this uh, group from all over. Um, uh, the link that we put there invites you directly into it. Um, and then if we're going to, um, we have some topics, webinar recordings, a couple of the general themes. Some of these are pretty thin right now, but we'll be growing those out. And then when we have an event or webinar, we, we post it here. Just while we're here, let me just show you that we also, the foundation has been running webinar series. Um, and we did one on social action this fall with the last two sessions happening this spring. So once you're in here, you can go look at this as well, which is how we presented these issues. Um, and in fact, there's a short video from a prior presentation on change theory and building power, for instance, the actual recording of the session we held, which is the live session, um, the homework for the faculty or staff in this training, and in some cases, a few students, some of the reflection questions, these then tie to the to the guide to teaching social action. There's the chapter, the, re, the, the related chapters in the student guide, and um, there's even put the portfolio questions and those kinds of things, all of which are in this opening section here. And there's lots of, so it just goes on and on. There's, we have lots of material. Um, that's not our, I'm sorry, right here, the overview. And you see the model, um, the readings, the various things we're trying to do. So that's a, that's a yet another resource. I think if you're interested in follow-up, that's the best place to start. Um, and uh, I will um, put my, well, I won't do it right now, but I, I, I'll, I'll put my, uh, my email up here somewhere as well. I'm not hard to find, bonner.org. I'm R. Hackett. We, we, we're running a webinar series now. We're looking to do a, uh, a, a more condensed um, uh, three or four day summer uh, training um, uh, to rather than stretch it out of the whole semester, to do it over uh, a, sh a shorter period of time, not during the, the actual semester. So we're looking at our next webinar series. And then as I said before, we did our this college summit, which was uh, really interesting and exciting and we'll be doing again something like this in April. Um, so that's the range of things we have here. Um, the goal again is to mainstream it and really to build a community among the, the, the folks teaching it to learn from each other, to reflect on what their, what their, uh, what worked, what didn't work, uh, to get some feedback on some new efforts and also to link the student campaigns where uh, where that's inspiring and even sort of similar across institutions. Um, okay. Clearly, changing policies is something all of us have been talking about in our work. Um, and I think that the, the civic and community engagement, political engagement, all that kind of stuff is uh, introduced here to, uh, for students in a very practical way. Uh, I, if it's not obvious already, this is not an easy class to teach. All experiential learning classes require extra kind of things that you, you, you're not always, uh, you can't always sort of schedule, number one. Number two, 
campaigns go in different directions. So you have to be quick on your feet to make adjustments. And you hear Scott talk about that. Part of the reason to build a community of practice is to have more folks doing it who can, who can share that with each other as we go along. This is uh, early stage um, in my mind. And so this idea of mainstreaming, uh, we've got you know, uh, quite a bit of work ahead of us. Um, I really appreciate everybody being here and, and we have more time right now. I'm gonna look at some of the questions but um, uh, and I'll put my email address on the mural as well as Scott, so you can you can track us down directly. And I would just add that one of the things that we're I'm, I'm actually writing right now is a foundation grant. Our goal is to try to get a grant so we could have a hundred faculty or staff receive a stipend to of a twenty five hundred dollars. That's how we've been most most successful. Like at San Jose State, we got a foundation to give that money at locally, and we were able to recruit a lot more faculty to do it when they said, okay, I'm, we're going to get $2,500 to do this, we're in. So we're going to try to do that at the national level and just we'll let you know how that's, how that's going if, if, we, if we can find that, those folks. And if anyone has any ideas about who might be able to fund that, that's, I'm, we're writing the grant right now and would love to hear from you. So I, I, someone asked specifically, Bobby, I sent it to you. I don't, I guess, uh, uh, um, would like to see what a campaign notebook looks like. I don't have a campaign notebook here, they're on, on the campus, but I could show you a PDF of the campus presentation, which is uh, which would be a very brief overview of what's in the campaign notebook. Did you get that, Bobby? I sent that to you. Uh, today? Just now on a- um, Oh yeah, I'll go look. So I could, if you could pull that up, I could show it, but it says it'll stop screen sharing. I'm scared to click that, maybe it'll disconnect me. Yeah. Uh, I actually don't see that. I apologize. I don't see it. Um, but, but those kind of examples are going to be up on the wiki. Yeah. They're going to be posted in the community of practice. Um, so you'll, we'll be able to, and I'll, I'll put a link into that on this mural. This mural board is not going to go away. So you can reference this. You can share the link with other folks. So these are our, our quote slides. I, at the top here, I put uh, both our email addresses. Scott, I used your Gmail account. Yeah, um, that's the one that I had available to me. Um, so the other thing is if it, it, both you might be interested, you might have other people are interested in this. Um, and uh, so we want, we just are interested in responding to that and trying to sort of recruit more folks. So do you think being open with your students with, uh, with sharing your own experiences of being discriminated against makes teaching these classes more effective? Scott? So I'm, I'm responding to somebody. Sorry, give, give me the question again. Do you think being open with your own students about sh with sharing your own experiences of being discriminated against makes teaching these classes more effective. Yeah, I, I think I think anytime you 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 bring in it, it, whether on a personal level, I think students respond to that. I think just collectively, no matter what we're teaching, but I think in this case, absolutely, I think yes. And I think the other thing is is that students, you know, one of the things that I ha I the students since they've never done this before, which is incredible if you think about it, we live in a democracy and here they are, some you know, students 19, 20, 25, 28, and they've never done anything that's democratic. It's, you know, other than maybe voting, let's hope they've done that, but where they've actually tried to change a policy, it's an indictment, I think, of our, of our institutions that not providing our young people this, and sometimes not so young, some, you know, some of my students are a little bit older, the, this opportunity. So absolutely. And what I do is I make sure the students read about and hear from previous students who've done this because they've got to believe. I'd say when I started and you tell students that we're going to change a policy, they're like, nah, like we can't do that. They don't believe it. And uh, really by the end of the semester, they, you know, I'd say the, the majority of them are believing that it is possible because they've, they've read about it, they've seen it, they've talked to students and they have participated in themselves. And again, uh, someone asked how, what percent, this is what I was answering to, sorry about that. What percent is on the campus? About 70%, 60 to 70% are on the campus, 30 to 40% are off the campus. And I would say this, you know, sometimes they do small things like, the demand was to have more printers in the library because they didn't, they couldn't get uh, access to printers because too many people are on that. That's a very small demand, 
they want it. The, there's two printers now that are weren't, that are there that weren't there before because the students. So they done something small and they had to do the still the whole process. Find out who the target was, the dean of the library, to make the request. And all that still happened, but they've also done the biggest thing they've done and the one they're, they're most recognized for on the campus is if you look at the picture of the change book, that is they, the students came up with the idea and they were the, the, the leaders of it along with a very broad based coalition, but because they had come up with it, they got a lot of attention was the minimum wage campaign. They changed the minimum wage in the city of San Jose on a proposition from eight to $10 and then to $15. In I think the single greatest increase in the history of the country on minimum wage. And I love that picture of that student who, if you normally dress like Patrick and the other students, like, you know, but here she is transformed by the experience as she knows she's going to be speaking. And this was a year after the students had led that campaign. They held a press conference to say what was the impact of it. And it was, it was 40,000 uh, folks getting an increase for, uh, in their minimum wage in our community. It was a huge victory. So they've done small things, they've done big things, but it really doesn't matter to me what they do as long as they're engaged in democracy. So maybe in the last three minutes, are there any questions that we can maybe answer that you, ha don't, you have? One thing I wanna throw out, I see somebody mentioning the Lilly Foundation, finding a lot of civic engagement, um, including especially with the Indiana Campus Compact. I'd be very interested, very interested in uh, other foundations' uh, willingness to support this kind of civic engagement, um, and uh, where that might be taking place. I know the Gun Foundation. I know the uh, the, uh, the Nord Family uh, Foundation in uh, Ohio provided some funding. Uh, a Bonner graduate is the was the head of that. He just is changing jobs this month to work for the Gun Foundation. In, in Cleveland, so part of our part of our outreach is going to be to funders, the funding community, to try to build this capacity, so that this is part of not just what's ever on every campus, but also the community, the, you know, the campus centers for civic and community engagement have this capacity within it. If we can't get a faculty to teach it, then let's teach it within our centers, so students are really equipped to make these kind of uh, uh, to run really well organized campaigns. They're not campaigns that have. 20 pages of demands and, you know, are kind of all over the place. Um, there are campaigns that have three identifiable, quantifiable demands uh, just to begin with and to build from that. And there's a bunch of sort of lessons learned that um, draw from lots of different uh, uh, um, sources. Um, yeah, not every, not every, every movement succeeds, correct. Is that hard to deal with? Scott? So I would, That'll be I, our final word. Yeah, so absolutely. I'd say out of the now 16 years, I think we've won 15 campaigns. You know, they've probably run close to 40. So they don't win every one. Some of them are still sitting on the, you know, they sit sometimes for five or six years. And then a student group like this one right now that's for a Japanese American uh, internment. Um, they want a mural and they want an educational uh, day on the day that the Japanese Americans were interned on our, on our campus is where it started. So they want that recognized and a day to remember that. That has, that has sat for five or six years, but a student group picked it up and I think they're going to win that campaign. So I, I think that there's, there's enough energy that the students that don't win in that semester, they still feel like they've, they've made progress. And that's that's important. And I tell them, you know, sometimes that it's, um, it, it takes time. You know, sometimes they win in a semester. Sometimes it takes two years. Sometimes it's longer, but they, it's like when you're building the, um, the cathedrals, you know, of, uh, you know, it takes time. You, you did your part by putting on the pyramids, you did your part in it. And I think that's important. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you. I just was sent a, 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 we were sent a note in the question and I'll take a look at this uh, community centric uh, funding models and um, thanks everybody. Maggie, I'll turn it back to you. Yes, Bobby and Scott, thank you so much for joining us today and for bringing more resources to our network. Um, we really just deeply appreciate your time and, and all this good information. So we'll definitely put this recording up on our website where folks can find it that have joined us today and others that are just gonna be watching this recording. 
So um, again, thanks so much. And we're just going to keep you. on continuing with this good work. Thank you. We appreciate you sharing. Be well. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.